Okay. Uh, I should start by uh, thanking Cliff Lynch for inviting me back, even though I'm retired, and for letting me debug this talk at Berkeley's Information Access Seminar. I plan to talk for 20 minutes and leave plenty of time for questions. A lot of information will be coming at you fast. Afterwards, I encourage you to consult the whole talk text of my talk uh, and much additional material on my blog. Follow the links to the sources to get the details that you probably missed. We're in a, a period when blockchain or distributed ledger technology is the solution to everything. So it's inevitable that it will be proposed as the solution to the problems of academic communication and digital preservation. In the second of a three-part series, Ian Mulvaney has a comprehensive review of the suggested applications of blockchain for academic communication in three broad classes. Those are priority claims, access to resources, and rights. Mulvaney discusses each of them in some detail and doesn't find a strong case for any of them. In a third part, he looks at some of the implementation efforts currently underway and divides their motivations into two groups. I quote, the first comes from commercial interests where management of rights, IP, and ownership is complex, hard to do, and has led to unusable systems that are driving researchers to sites like Sci-Hub, scaring the bejesus out of publishers in the process. The other trend is for a desire to move to a decentralized web and a decentralized system of validation and reward, in a way trying to move even further away from the control of publishers. It's absolutely fascinating to me uh, that two diametrically opposed philosophical sides are converging on the same technology as the answer to their problems. Could this technology perhaps be just holding up an unproven and untrustworthy mirror to our desires rather than providing any real viable solutions? Uh, this talk answers Mulvaney's question in the, in the affirmative. I've been writing skeptically about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology for more than five years. What are my qualifications for such a long history of pontification? More than 15 years ago, and nearly five years before Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin Protocol, a cryptocurrency based on a decentralized consensus mechanism using proof of work, my co-authors and I won a best paper award at the prestigious SOSP workshop for a decentralized consensus mechanism using proof of work. It's the protocol underlying the LOCKS system. The originality of our work didn't lie in decentralization, distributed consensus, or proof of work. Uh, all of these were part of the nearly three decades of research and implementation leading up to the Bitcoin protocol, as described by Arvind Narayanan and Jeremy Clark in a paper called Bitcoin's Academic Pedigree. Our work was original only in its application of these techniques to statistical fault tolerance. Nakamoto's only in its application of them to preventing double spending in cryptocurrencies. Uh, we're going to walk through the design of a system to perform some function, say monetary transactions, storing files, recording reviewers' contributions to academic communication, verifying archival content, whatever. Being of a naturally suspicious turn of mind, you don't want to trust any single central entity. Instead, want a decentralized system. You place your trust in the consensus of a large number of entities, which will in effect vote on the uh, state transitions of your system, the transactions, reviews, archival content, whatever. You hope that the good entities will outvote the bad entities. In the jargon, the system is trustless, which is a misnomer. Techniques using multiple voters to maintain the state of a system in the presence of unreliable and malign voters were first published in the Byzantine General's Problem by Lamport and co-authors in 1982. Alas, Byzantine Fault Tolerance, BFT, requires a central authority to authorize entities to take part. In the blockchain jargon, it is permissioned. You would rather let anyone interested take part, a permissionless system with no central control. The security of your permissionless system depends upon the assumption of uncoordinated choice, the idea that each voter acts independently upon its own view of the system's state. If anyone can take part, your system is vulnerable to civil attacks, in which an attacker creates many apparently independent voters who are actually under his sole control. If creating and maintaining a voter is free, 
Anyone can win any vote they choose simply by creating enough civil voters. So creating and maintaining a voter has to be expensive. Permissionless systems can defend against civil attacks by requiring a vote to be accompanied by a proof of the expenditure of some resource. This is where proof of work comes in, a concept originated by Cynthia Dwork and Moni Nara in 1992. To vote in a proof of work blockchain such as Bitcoins or Ethereum's requires computing very many otherwise useless hashes. The idea is that the good voters will spend more, compute more useless hashes than the bad voters. Uh, Brunemeyer and Abadi's blockchain trilemma shows that a blockchain has to choose at most two of the following three attributes. That's correctness, decentralization, and cost efficiency. Obviously, your system needs the first two, so the third has to go. Running a voter, mining in the jargon in your system has to be expensive if the system is to be secure. No one will do it unless they are rewarded. They can't be rewarded in fiat currency because that would need some central mechanism for paying them. So the reward has to come in the form of coins generated by the system itself, a cryptocurrency. To scale, permissionless systems need to be based on a cryptocurrency. The system's state transitions will need to include cryptocurrency transactions in addition to records of files, reviews, archival content, whatever. Your system needs names for the parties to these transactions. There's no central authority handing out names, so the parties need to name themselves. As proposed by David Chome in 1981, they can do so by generating a public-private key pair and using the public key as the name for the source or sync of each transaction. In practice, uh, this is implemented in wallet software, which stores one or more key pairs for use in transactions. The public half of the pair is a pseudonym. Unmasking the person behind the pseudonym turns out to be fairly easy in practice. The security of the system depends upon the user and the software keeping the private key secret. This can be difficult as Nicholas Weaver's computer security group at Berkeley discovered when their wallet was compromised and their bitcoins were stolen. The capital and operational costs of running a miner include buying hardware, power, network bandwidth, staff time, etc. Bitcoin's volatile price, high transaction fees, low transaction throughput, and large proportion of failed transactions mean that almost no legal mer merchants accept pay payment in Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. Thus, one essential part of your system is one or more exchanges at which the miners can sell their cryptocurrency rewards for the fiat currency they need in order to pay their bills. Who is on the other side of these trades? The answer has to be speculators, betting that the price of the cryptocurrency will increase. Thus, a second essential part of your system is a general belief in the inevitable rise in price of the coins by which miners are rewarded. If miners believe that the price will go down, they will sell their rewards immediately, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Permissionless blockchains require an inflow of speculative funds at an average rate greater than the current rate of mining rewards if the price is not to collapse. To maintain Bitcoin's price at $4,000, it's currently about $3,500, requires an inflow of $300,000 an hour. In order to spend enough to be secure, say $300,000 an hour, you need a lot of miners. It turns out that an third essential part of your system is a small number of mining pools. Bitcoin has the equivalent of about 3 million Altminer S9 chips and a block time of 10 minutes. Each S9, costing maybe $1,000, can expect a reward about once every 60 years. It will be obsolete in about a year, so only one in 60 will ever earn anything. To smooth out their income, miners join pools, contributing their mining power and receiving the corresponding fraction of the rewards earned by the pool. These pools have strong economies of scale, so successful cryptocurrencies end up with a majority of their mining power in three to four pools. Each of these big pools can expect a reward about every hour or so. These blockchains aren't decentralized, they're centralized around a few large pools. 
at multiple times in 2014, one mining pool controlled more than 51% of the Bitcoin mining power. At almost all times since, three to four pools have controlled the majority of the Bitcoin mining power. Currently, two of them are controlled by Bitmain, the dominant supply of mining ASICs. With the advent of mining as a service, 51% attacks have become endemic among the smaller altcoins. The security of a blockchain depends on the assumption that these few pools are not conspiring together outside the blockchain, an assumption that's impossible to verify in the real world and by Murphy's law is therefore false. Similar off-chain collusion among cryptocurrency traders allows for extremely profitable pump and dump schemes. In practice, the security of a blockchain depends not merely on the security of the pro protocol itself, but on the security of the core software and the wallets and exchanges that use to store and trade its cryptocurrency. This ancillary software has bugs, such as the recently re revealed major vulnerability in Bitcoin Core, the par parity wallet fiasco, and the routine heists using vulnerabilities in exchange software. Recent game theoretic analysis suggests that there are strong economic limits to the security of cryptocurrency-based blockchains. For safety, the total value of transactions in a block needs to be less than the value of the block reward. Your system needs an append-only data structure to which records of the transactions, files, reviews, archival content, whatever, are appended. It would be bad if the miners could vote to rewrite history, undoing these records. In the jargon, the system needs to be immutable, which is another misnomer. <coughs> the necessary data structure for this purpose was published by Stuart Haber and Scott Stornetta in 1991. A company using their technique has been providing a centralized service of securely timestamping documents, effectively a blockchain, for nearly a quarter of a century. It is a firm of Mer Merkel or Hashtree published by Ralph Merkel in 1980. For blockchains, it's a linear chain to which fixed size blocks are added at regular intervals. Each block contains the hash of its predecessor, so it's a chain of blocks. The blockchain is mutable. It's just rather hard to mutate it without being detected because of the Merkel tree's hashes and easy to recover because there are lots of copies keeping stuff safe. But this is a double-edged sword. Immutability makes systems incompatible with the GDPR, and immutable systems to which anyone can post information will be suppressed by governments. A user of your system wanting to perform a transaction, store a file, record a review, whatever, needs to persuade miners to include their transaction in a block. Miners are coin-operated. You need to pay them to do so. How much do you need to pay them? That question reveals another economic problem, fixed supply and variable demand, which equals variable price. Each block is, in effect, a blind auction among the pending transactions. So let's talk about CryptoKitties, a game that brought the Ethereum blockchain to its knees, despite the bold claims that it could handle unlimited decentralized applications. How many users did it take to cripple the network? It was far fewer than non-blockchain apps can handle with ease. CryptoKitties peaked at about 14,000 users. Neopets, a similar centralized game, peaked at about 2,500 times as many. CryptoKitties' average price per transaction spiked 465% between November 28th and December 12th as the game got popular, a major reason why it stopped being popular. The same phenomenon happened during Bitcoin's price spike at around the same time. Cryptocurrency transactions are affordable only if no one wants to transact. When everyone does, they immediately become unaffordable. Uh, Nakamoto's Bitcoin blockchain was designed only to support recording transactions. It can be abused for other purposes, such as storing illegal content, but it's likely that you need additional functionality which is where Ethereum's smart contracts come in. These are fully functional programs written in a JavaScript-like language that are embedded in Ethereum's blockchain. They are mainly used to implement Ponzi schemes, but they can also be used to implement initial coin offerings, games such as CryptoKitties, and gambling parlors. 
Further, in on-chain vote buying and the rise of dark DAOs, Philip Dion and co-authors show that smart contracts also provide for untraceable on-chain collusion in which the parties are mutually pseudonymous. Uh, smart contracts are programs and programs have bugs. Some of the bugs are exploitable vulnerabilities. Research has shown that the, with, uh, the rate at which vulnerabilities in programs are discovered increases with the age of the program. The problems caused by making vulnerable software immutable were revealed by the first major smart contract. The decentralized autonomous organization, the DAO, was released on the 30th of April 2016, but on the 27th of May 2016, Dino Mark, Vlad Zamfir, and Imin Goods Sira posted a call for a temporary moratorium on the DAO, pointing out some of its vulnerabilities. It was ignored. Three weeks later, when the DAO contained about 10% of all the ether in circulation, a combination of these vulnerabilities was used to steal its contents. The loot was restored by a hard fork, the blockchain's version of mutability. Since then, it's become the norm for smart contract authors to make them, quote, un upgradable, unquote, so that bugs can be fixed. Upgradable is another way of saying immutable in name only. So this is the list of people your permissionless system has to trust if it's going to work as advertised over the long term. So where have we ended up? Uh, you started out to build a trustless decentralized system, but you have ended up with a trustless system that trusts a lot of people you have every reason not to trust. A decentralized system that is centralized around a few large mining pools that you have no way of knowing aren't conspiring together. An immutable system that either has bugs you cannot fix or is not immutable. A system whose security depends on it being expensive to run and which is thus dependent upon a continuing inflow of funds from speculators and a system whose coins are convertible into large amounts of fiat currency via irreversible pseudonymous transactions, which is thus an irresistible target for crime. If the price keeps going up, the temptation for your trust to be violated is considerable. If the price starts going down, the temptation to cheat to recover losses is even greater. So maybe it's time for a rethink. Suppose you give up on the idea that anyone can take part and, and accept that you have to trust a central authority to decide who can and who can't vote. You will have a permission system. The first thing that happens is that it's no, po no longer possible to mount a Sybil attack, so there's no reason a running a node need be expensive. You can use BFT to establish consensus as IBM's hyperledger, the canonical permission blockchain system does. You need many fewer nodes in the network, and running a node just got way cheaper. Overall, the aggregated cost of the system got orders of magnitude cheaper. Now there's a central authority. It can collect fiat currency for network services and use it to pay the nodes. No need for cryptocurrency, exchanges, pools, speculators, or wallets, so much less temptation for bad behavior. This is now the list of entities you trust. Trusting a central authority to determine the voter role has eliminated the need to trust a whole lot of other entities. The permission system is more trustless, and since there is no need for pools, the network is more decentralized despite having fewer nodes. Uh, how few nodes, how many nodes does your permission blockchain need? The rule for BFT is that three F plus one nodes can survive F simultaneous failures. That's an awful lot fewer than you need for a permissionless proof of work system. What you get from BFT is a system that, unless it encounters more than F simultaneous failures, remains available and operating normally. The problem with BFT is that if it ever encounters more than F simultaneous failures, the state of the system is irrecoverable. If you want to be a system that can be relied upon for the long term, you need a way to recover from disaster. Successful permissionless blockchains have lots of copies keeping stuff safe, so recovering from a disaster that doesn't affect all of them is manageable. So in addition to implementing BFT, you need to back up the state of the system each block time, ideally to write once media so the attacker can't change it. 
But if you're going to have an immutable backup of the system state, and you don't need continuous uptime, you can rely on the backup to recover from failures. In that case, you can get away with, say, two replicas of the blockchain in conventional databases, saving even more money. I've shown that whatever consensus mechanism they use, permissionless blockchains are not sustainable for very fundamental economic reasons. These include the need for speculative inflows and mining pools, security linear in cost, economies of scale, and fixed supply versus variable demand. Proof of work blockchains are also environmentally unsustainable. The top five cryptocurrencies are estimated to use as much energy as the Netherlands. This isn't to take away from Nakamoto's ingenuity. Proof of work is the only consensus system shown to work well for permissionless blockchains at scale. The consensus mechanism works, but energy consumption and emergent behaviors at higher levels of the system make it unsustainable. So now there's time for questions. And if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down uh, and, and switch to this mic.